uh, crown bees. Uh, uh, we are not entomologists. We're not the, the, the experts out there, but boy, oh boy, we really know a lot about the mason bee. Uh, our company cares about the bee. We care about the products. You'll learn, um, you'll learn more about that online um, or here in the, in the webinar. And then, um, yeah, we teach. If you haven't seen our website yet, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of learning that goes behind there, and we we collaborate. We collaborate with researchers. We collaborate with our peers and competitors. Uh, the more we do, I think, the better off the world. So, what you're going to hear today, um, talking about uh, bees in general. We'll talk a lot about solitary bees. We'll then get into mason bee characteristics. Just about the bees are in the spring, how best to raise them. And then we've got some other things we're doing, not just about the mason bees, but there are other programs. We'll talk just briefly about that. And throughout all of this, uh, if you have a question, we're going, on, we're going to be going just a couple slides before we stop and look to answer some of the, the more general questions. So please, upper left-hand corner, you'll see Q&A. Just type a question there, and Damaris will be able to field those and, and get those asked. So, uh, native bees, worldwide, there's a bunch. It could be 24,000, we're still finding bees. North America, there's a good 4,000, plus or minus, we're still finding new bees. Uh, but our premise uh, is that the native bees that are across the country are probably the best pollinators across the country, and we're just just starting to learn how these things work. Uh, a little bit about bees. So when we talk about bees, so out of those 20 some thousand species, 10% are social. So think honeybee, bumblebee, where there's one queen and a whole bunch of, of workers. And most of them, so 90% are, are solitary, where every female is a queen. And she's only living one little time of the year and the eggs she lays are next year's bees. So most of the bees are that. And even as funny little thing, three, you know, 0 0.003, there are seven honeybee species out of the 21,000. It's honeybees are a very, very, very small subsection, but boy, oh boy, that's all we know about today. And that's okay. Um, any questions before I jump? And Damaris, you can say no questions. I'm fine. Right. Well, we, we do have a lot of questions, but I think that they'll be better answered as we move as we along. Move. Yeah. Great. Then let's move along. Um, so roughly when we're talking solitary bees, uh, every worker typically is the female. She works all alone. She's doing the mating. She's gathering the pollen and the nectar. She's laying the egg. She's sealing her chamber. She's doing all of these things. And the cool thing about a solitary bee is because they're doing all of these things, they don't have the time to sit there and defend their hole. And so they really aren't designed that way, and they, and they don't. So you, you can get stung by a mason bee. It's very, very hard. And they're only doing it when you're, when you're squishing your hand. I've gotten stung between, I grabbed a handful of live bees and, and I'm moving them, and I got stung between the web of my fingers. I had to look to see where she stung me. It hurt, but it's it's a very um, much different than a social bee. So the female is doing everything. She is she's alive for about six weeks, and she is doing it all. The males, uh, they're going to come out first. Their job is to provide um, sperm for the females, and so they're going to mate. They do their <laughs> they have a very short life, and after two weeks, they're gone, and the females are just running the show. So appreciate that almost all bees of the world live about six weeks. In a honeybee hive, a thousand bees uh, are, are born a day, a thousand bees die a day. Okay, so with the mason bees and the leafcutter bees and all these other bees, they all live about six weeks. The eggs they lay this year our next year's bees. And so when they're done, those eggs are gonna um, become larvae, consume the pollen, and then um, be there for next year. 
So when you're looking for those six weeks, there are some bees that are active early spring, like right now. There are other bees that come out maybe in May or June. Other bees are coming out deep into the summer. So all of these bees have evolved that if there's pollen in that area, the only reason that pollen could be there is there's some bee that is active at that same time. Otherwise, the plant wouldn't be able to exist. So there are bees that, you know, all through the whole thing, and we're focusing today just on predominantly the um, early spring blue orchard mesa bee. If no great questions, I'll move on past that. So here is the mason bee. And so we're saying mason bee, we're really saying cat or dog. There's hundreds of species of whole nesting bees in the Osmia range. So this is, the common name is Blue Orchard, and the scientific Osmia lignaria is this one specific bee. It is native to uh, North America, so across Canada, and really just not down found, uh, found down in the uh, Florida area. It focuses on everything as a generalist. So fruit, nut trees around us, rhododendrons, dandelions, it's gathering pollen from everything. And what's really cool, we'll get into this, it is a phenomenal cross pollinator. So when you're using these bees uh, purposely for food, they are spreading pollen. They're an amazing insect. So if we're looking at specifically the blue orchard, uh, a lot of people say it looks like a fly, uh, but oh, Baby, look at those cool eyeballs and the antennas are long. Uh, flies are much different. Uh, they are hibernating as adults. So about now they are emerging from their cocoons. They don't have to do any development. They just chew out of their cocoons and there they are. These bees, since they're one of the earliest bees, they're designed to fly in eh, not pouring rains, but um, once they're out, they can fly in a high, high 40s and into the 50s um, once it hits about 80 degrees they'll slow down that's they're not designed for that so they are a cool bee and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about different types of bees this bee uses moist mud to seal each little egg chamber that they've got inside there so it's a mud using bee there are bees that use tree resin bees that use cactus pulp there's some really cool bees out there that go in holes and again, it's a generalist, it's visiting all spring flowers. So let's compare what we know, honeybee versus um, this bee. So honeybee, 1,500, 1,000 eggs are laid a day. They, you know, and I think a honeybee is an awesome honey making bee. They are able to fly a long ways because they've been designed, they need 1,000 eggs a day. You know, They need the pollen for those thousand eggs a day. Each little pollen is about maybe a pea-sized bit of pollen. It takes multiple flights to get that. And so these, you know, the hive, they've learned how to carry their pollen on their hind legs really well. When you look at this picture here, this was a picture taken, oh, this few months ago in Africa. This pollen here, when we look at it, we say, oh my gosh, look, it's pollinating. If you were to hit that pollen on a bee's leg, it, it's like this. It's solid, it's sticky, and it's not falling off. This is bee food. Dr. Eric Musson years ago from UC Davis. Dave, he says, when you're seeing the pollen on those hind legs and the back, those back pollen pockets, that's not pollen anymore, that's bee food. So these guys are awesome pollen carriers because they need every pollen they can get back to the hive. Your mason bees, eh, super unsophisticated. Uh, instead of thousands a day, each female maybe has 25 eggs in her body. She stays really close. So about a, a hundred meters, 300 feet away from her house, uh, she's flying in that range. That's about maybe six acres that she'll fly in a circle around there, gathering this pollen. It's carried loose on her body. Here's a picture that I think Carl took that just that pollen is just stuck everywhere. And it's, it's there stuck dry between the hairs it falls off, okay? Every flower this bee is belly flopping into, the pollen's just off on that flower, and the next flower, it's falling off again. So they are amazing pollen spreaders. 
The other piece is just to understand a honeybee, again, super sophisticated. They have a thing called a waggle dance. And based on how that waggle dance, the angle of the dance matches the declination of the sun, the length of the dance is how far to fly. Every female is sent off in every direction coordinated so they get all the pollen back to the hive. Super sophisticated, long distance pollinator, five miles even, okay? Mason bees, mm, not, so, not so good, messy. They're working by themselves. They know where they started. They can find their house real easily, but they're just meandering in their little flight path, gathering pollen here or there, and they hit a tree. They don't stay on that tree. They bounce to the next tree. And so pollen, again, is just being spread. And that, that difference there, the meandering and the dry pollen makes this bee a phenomenal pollinator. We've had people over the years uh, complain, Dave, I've got branches breaking. Well, put boards under them. But uh, you know, there's, there's pages and pages of testimony. When you're using these bees, you're getting more cherries, more strawberries. This is science, so it shows more cherries, more strawberries, plums and apples and kiwis and you know. So it's it's they're an awesome bee. So Demaris, do we have any questions that I could answer that relates to what we've just talked about? Yeah, we had an interesting question about how high up do mason bees fly when they're gathering pollen? That's a great question. Um, we, uh, when they're gathering pollen, uh, in my backyard, I've got these huge 50-foot tall big leaf maples. And I've got seed sets all up there. So I know the bees are going from the ground all the way up 50-some feet. So they will get the pollen. If you go to a, you know, so where to place the house though, we've typically put in the Mason Bee house down where we can see it. Um, we've learned in, in research that if you put a Mason Bee house up above the canopy, uh, the bees just don't use them. They'll go there, but they want to nest down below. Um, another, another good question is what kind of plants should people add to help feed the Mason Bees? That is a great question. Um, the bees are going six acres. So if you look around um, to put one little, uh, okay, they're going a big range. And research has shown that one bee per day needs about a square yard of, of flowers. Okay, so if you just buy one bush, it's really only going to support one bee-ish. Even, even them would be kind of sparse. I would always relax unless I'm in a desert, the bees will find if in a six acre radius, that's a lot of flowers. There's a lot of dandelions and roadies and whatever. Uh, plant things that you're trying to pollinate. So I would, I would lean on uh, food production if you're really thinking about it. Anything else, Damaris? Um, I think that's good for now. Okay. Let's get into um, what does the mason bee need? Um, it's not a hive. Uh, we kind of think of them as mason bee colonies, and they live in a house. So these bees are opportunist. They're not drilling into wood like a carpenter bee. They're not, so they're an opportunist. They're using pre-made holes. This is one of the larger mason bees, and so they prefer an eight millimeter size hole. Uh, five sixteenths of an inch. They can use the bigger things, but um, a bigger hole, like a half inch, there's some bamboo products out there. Uh, the bee spends more time putting mud in there than they are gathering pollen. So it's kind of frowned upon to have too big of a hole, about a pencil size. Uh, if you drop down into like a six millimeter, uh, they, have a, they could use them smaller bees, but those are um, eight mils of where you're trying to head. And then um, because she's a solitary bee, every female owns her own hole. You'll see them uh, as they go into a hole, ah, it doesn't smell right. She backs out, she'll go find a different hole. So this one, ah, yeah, and she stays and goes in there. Okay, so they know their own hole by look and by smell. And the cool thing about a hole nesting bee is you can take a, a complete mason bee tube that has all the bees in it from your yard 
and then move them to a friend's yard or a farm. And so we know that whole nesting bees uh, can be moved from point A to point B. Not so easily done with ground nesting bees. So inside the hole, uh, the bee has gathered pollen and nectar. And so 30 or so trips worth of pollen gathering, she, she walks into the hole, peels all the pollen off her body and just scoots it back there. And then she needs that pollen and nectar. nectar. She's carrying the nectar in her mouth. She spits it out and she's mixing that bee bread. And so about a pea-sized bit of pollen, she then lays an egg. It looks like about a grain of rice. And then like all other species of these bees, they need to protect that little chamber with something. The mason bee that we're talking about seals it with moist clayey mud. There are bees that are designed to work with resin from trees or uh, mesquite from manzanita. I mean, there, there's all these different types of mediums, but the one we touch uses clay mud. She starts from the backside and all of the deep holes at the end, you know, in the backside of these holes, she fertilizes. She actually takes the sperm from the male, works it onto the egg, and that becomes a female. So the females are in on the inside of the hole, and the backside of the hole are unfertilized male eggs. And so uh, the kind of sad part is in this, you know, in a six inch long hole, uh, the males are there to be eaten by birds and other things. So it's kind of hard to be in a male in this species. But inside are protected females, outside are are the smaller males. At the tail end of the hole, she puts a, a, a lot of mud, a lot, you know, probably a, a good quarter inch of mud stuff back there, just trying to stop uh, the predators from working at her. So relevant questions, Damaris. Um, did, I was um, replying to some people, so I might not have heard it, but how many eggs does a female nest uh, lay inside of each six inch long nesting hole? Uh, the, 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 question, the blue orchard typically lays about an egg per inch. So in a six inch long hole, typically you'll see six to seven eggs. Uh, there are other mason bees that are on um, the corner frond is across North America now. It's a Japanese bee, uh, uses mud. It's identical. It's a identical characteristics. It's brown versus black. And if you look inside that hole, Mm, 10 to 11. So a lot more eggs are laid in there. So it's maybe a little more productive. And in each bee is roughly 25 eggs. So we see a female mason bee might fill two holes. Um, so another question is, did the male bees use the nesting holes? Um, those poor, <laughs> those poor males. Um, no. They're going to come out. You'll see, like if you have a, a cocoon hatchery like we do, where there's a lot of cocoons in there, the males will emerge first, typically. Little, little, they come out first, and they're back in. They're just trying to find the females. You'll see them going in there just waiting for the female to come out and mate with her. Um, they tend to not stay in the holes at all. They're out um, underneath leaves. They're, they just get wet, and they're just you know, poor guys. Um, they don't have a good life. It's the females that get the holes. Hey, hey, Dave, um, would you mind quickly explaining how the length of the channel, the nesting mm. hole, uh, is proportionate to the uh, male and female uh, eggs that are laid? Great question, too. Um, when the mason bee, she knows where birds can get to. So take a, uh, take a long six-inch hole. She knows that she's she's trying to get as many females as she can. So maybe a real long hole might have more females, but she's laying um, roughly two females for every three males. So in a six inch hole, maybe two to three females are on the inside and three to four males are on the outside. The shorter you make the hole, then all of a sudden she she knows that she's got maybe one female and three males. And so with these really short holes, uh, there's a lot of products out there that are three inches long or four inches long. You maybe have one female only or maybe none just because the, the bees are looking to uh, protect those eggs. So the shorter the hole, the worse off it is for um, uh, bees for next year. 
Great question, Carl. Thanks. Any more, Damaris? Oh, someone was just asking if all of the female bees hatch at the same time. When you watch, so we have loose cocoons, and we'll talk about why that's important to us. Uh, but inside a nesting hole, uh, you'll find that the males will typically come out first. And in this hole, you might have a, a male come out. Uh, the, the reason they emerge, it's warm enough. The energy that they survive through the winter on is depleted. And so they're, they're, they're hungry internally. And so the males are going to come out first and then the females. But they sit there and they wait. I don't know exactly what the triggers are, but... Um, uh, the males will, will all come out, and then you'll find that the females, um, the first one just comes out, and the next one, she's already chewed through a cocoon, and she's, um, we think that they even just nip the first one in the, in the rear. Hey, hey, get out of the way. I'm here. Um, there are times when there's like a, a dead bee in the middle, and the bees on the backside just uh, chew through and, and make it to life. Um, and the reason I know that they've all come out at times we've seen here in the Northwest where um, it was so warm, it was 50 something, and the bees should be coming out. And then all of a sudden it got super cold and it was 40 degrees for a week or so. And um, unfortunately, all the energy that the bees spent trying to get out of that cocoon, uh, when they were waiting to come out, they just died. They just ran out of energy and you just have four or five females lined up dead. So um, they all kind of come out at about the same time. Ready to go on? Yeah, I think we can move on. Okay, specifically, gosh, how do we raise these things? So again, gentle, laid back, awesome pollinators. Um, roughly, um, you know, if you're looking at what's going on here, roughly a hole per cocoon, and and we're going to say they're super easy to raise, uh, and we'll we'll get deeper into it. So just pure life cycle. Uh, the bees have emerged in the spring as fully formed adults. So right now they're emerging, they're mating, the males are um, mated and, and then they're gone, okay? Uh, so the females are, are gathering the pollen, laying the eggs, it's all, all in the spring. By six weeks later, um, Actually, let me let me take an aside here. Um, you are able to choose when do you want your mason bees to come out. We do talk, and I'll get here in a second, about you're storing your bees in the fridge. If the bees are only going to be around for six weeks, and you want to have um, bees in your yard longer for the spring, you can take some bees out early on. We typically, in our raising the bees, we'll put a quarter of the bees out um, late March. We wait a couple weeks, we put out most of the bees, and then we wait a couple more weeks and put out the last quarter. And so we have bees uh, put out in that area four to five weeks. And so we have 10 to 11 weeks of actually pollination because we separated our release of the bees. You're able to do that. Okay, so uh, springtime, they're nesting. Uh, when they're dead, so typically right around um, early June, maybe late May, blueberry season time, uh, the bees are dead, and the eggs that they laid have now begun hatching and eating that pollen loaf that the female left for them. Through the summer, they're, they've consumed all the pollen. They're now a big old larva. If you are to open up, you'd see this grub. It's not a bee-looking thing. It's just old grub, and it sits there and begins to spin its cocoon um, late June, spin in a cocoon. It then pauses for a week or so, and then um, begins to develop uh, into an adult bee, kind of like a butterfly. So it metamorphoses uh, July, August, and it's a fully formed bee in the fall. So now that it's there, it's got its fuel tanks are 100%, and it's ready to just survive through the winter. And through the winter, the uh, metabolic rate of the, of the bee, up and down, it's just uh, it's warm and cold. It's slowly consuming the fats in its body. And by spring, it's out of fats and ready to go. 
So to put in kind of a little different words, here's um, in the spring, uh, we're not talking a lot of time here, okay? You're just putting the cocoons out. You can spread it over a couple weeks, whatever you want to do, but you're releasing the bees. In the spring, you're just watching them. It's, they're really distracting. They're an awesome bee to watch. In the summer, uh, we want you to protect these bees. A lot of birds want to get to them. There's some pests out there, so we'll, we help you understand how to protect. In the, um, they're now stored someplace in a garage or shed where they've got summer warmth for them to develop. In the fall, you're gonna learn how to harvest. Really easy to do. Harvest means opening holes up and just separating pests from the good guys, the cocoons. And in the winter, you're just storing cocoons. Okay, so this is this is really easy. Once once a month, our our, our team we collectively there's a thing called bee mail that we just say, hey, it's it's April. Do this. Here's tricks of the trade. So you don't have to memorize any of this. You want to say, can just wait for B-mail and we'll just tell you what to do. So that's the ins and outs. Any questions there? Let's see. Oh, um, someone was asking about the, on the previous slide about metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. And if I remember it's, they have five stages of development. So they go from an egg that hatches into a small larva Various and instars. Yeah. yeah, there's like four or five instars as they mm -hmm. grow, and then they start spinning a cocoon. And when they're inside the cocoon, they pupate into that's like the teenage stage, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, um, as a pupa, they are they look like an adult, but they don't have wings and they're white. And then they develop in from pupa into an adult that's when they gain um pigment Older and wings color. and hair and, yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and, then, um, and there's one little yeah. last little part that if you um there's like a three week period of time where the bee has been um using surviving off carbohydrates to it translates into the now it survives by consuming the fats in its abdomen so it's like a three week little transition there Mm -hmm. And then it's just a weight. Yeah. And um, mason bees, because there's just one generation per year, the larva and the pupa, they take a lot of pauses. They take a lot of hibernation pauses between. They're not in a hurry. Yeah. 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 So, um, if you get our mason bee observer nesting tray, you'll be able to see the mason bees before they spin, finish spinning the cocoon. You'll be able to see them eat the pollen loaf. And then you'll be able to watch them spin the cocoon. You won't be able to see them um, become a pupa or an adult, but you'll know that it's happening inside of the cocoon. Yeah, you also can watch them. Yeah, they're they're a lot of fun to watch as they grow. Yes. But okay. I think that's relevant. So yeah, we have other Understood. questions for later. Is there? Thanks. Okay. Um. So, what type of holes should you use? Uh, we are strong advocates of what's best for the bee. Okay, so whether you're out getting teasel or doing Japanese knotweed or raising, you know, whatever, uh, rolling your own paper tubes, natural is best because um, the the pollen and nectar that goes into there is moist and needs to wick away a bit, and so whether it's paper or wood or reeds, it's just there's a natural absorption, so local, natural, okay? Um, six inches long. And it could be seven or eight, but six inches is a good length. And um, all of our houses are designed for that six inches, so six inches is there. We think that allows you to get the right female, two females to three males. Breathable. And we'll talk about why, but easy to open. So reeds just snap open, paper tubes unwind, uh, wood trays uh, can come apart. So please avoid. Um, there's some stuff out there that people um, just sell because uh, they're making money. And bamboo is cheap. It's made offshores and it's there in Costco and Home Depots and and bamboo because it's so structurally sound 
can't be opened. You can. I've tried it with a Bowie knife and tried to get in there. It's it, without damaging the bees is very hard. Okay. Short holes have less females. Uh, too big, too fat has uh, birds able to get deeper into there. So, you know, we're, we're trying to say um, use natural material that can be opened up that's the right size. Drilled blocks of wood, um, you, you, we'll talk about harvesting and why it's important in a second. Um, but you can't get to the, you can't open things up and you just got pests that just build up behind there. Um, you can take wood trays or uh, drill blocks and take like parchment paper and curl it up and stuff it in there and pull it back out. So uh, there's a modification to a, a wood tr drill block wood that would be okay. Okay, so I really, yeah, so, really, really want to have questions here on holes. Yeah, so we had one good question about if you want the back end of a nesting hole to be closed or open. If, um, so, uh, okay, the cool part about that type of a question, it allows you to say, say, well, what's natural? And so naturally, uh, we don't find bees using open-ended holes because there's no um, uh, means of protecting. They're not designed to, uh, they never go down empty holes, really don't. Uh, I think that's all there was they might. Uh, most holes need a back to it. I have, and, seen, and okay, I have seen these bees, if there's no holes at all, they'll go into like a drawer and make adobe huts. So they'll spend 90% of their time building a complete um, adobe hut and then inside there will be a little pollen mound. I mean, they can make their own hole. It's just so much effort make, you know, doing the mud piece versus pollinating. Yeah, they're yeah, an adaptive so bee. Are, but our our nesting holes are sealed at the back end. Yes, all of ours are. Oh, yep. Was it simple enough? No other questions? Um, I think that was the only one about nesting. Oh, the other, there was, I remember now, there's a question about if you made your um, reusable wood trays out of cedar or a different type of wood. Oh, that's a great question. Um, our woods trays are made out of alder. Uh, we've used pine and we've used alder. I don't, not cedar. Okay, if you, um, uh, cedar has a natural, wet cedar has a natural insecticide in it that, that kills things. You can actually get a pesticide based out of, of cedar oils. So everything but cedar. And then uh, we did an experiment years ago with what uh, type of wood our leaf cutter bees wanted, and we found that they liked poplar and um, uh, and alder best. Didn't like spruce. I mean, so there must be something smelled in spruce. But so yeah. I think alder and poplar and pine are probably good nesting trays. The, yeah, I think I have a feeling that spruce is pretty pretty smelly wood. Yeah, pitchy or something. Good. There's a good word for um, it. Yeah, so th there are a couple more questions popping up about nesting materials. Um, do you think that the reeds are able to deter pests? Um, or there is, bird, is there? You, a yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I just want to. I want to be. I want to be fair. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are pests that move down the hole with the bee, pollen mite, chalk brood, uh, Houdini fly, bird. Yeah peckers, you know, yeah. um, there are pests that go in from the side wall. Mono, Dantomer, mono is a parasitic wasp uh, that reeds typically can stop. Too thin of paper tubes. There's a lot of cheaper paper tubes out there. They can get right through the side walls. And then we, you know, so mono is a, is a high level of pest that uh, is stopped by um, wood trays. Uh, the B tube and insert, this is too thick and reads uh, stop mono. Mm -hmm. And so if someone has a cardboard tube that's too hard to unravel, what can they put inside of it to help make it easier to harvest? I would I would roll on parchment paper, would be my two cents. We've got, an, we have, our inserts are made out of a, a smooth paper, um, but parchment paper to do that might be an answer. Okay. And then one more question that, um, is it okay if someone has 
they don't have very many reeds inside of their house. But oh, the they, number. Yeah, um, the number of reeds. Yeah, so each mason bee maybe goes in two. So if you've got just 10 mason bees, you only need maybe 15 or so reeds or paper tubes or, or holes. So um, I, I would always think through a hole per cocoon might be the answer, knowing that some of the cocoons are male. So kind of that little, you got 100 cocoons, I might have 100 holes. Um, when you're looking at a house and you're putting that house out there, sometimes there's a lot of um, empty space in there that is easily filled by uh, wasps or, mm -hmm. or bird nesting. Uh, if you have don't have a lot of holes, just fill this top part with uh, sticks or rocks or bunched up yeah. paper. Less less yeah. empty space is best. Yeah. So I would like to point out that if you have our Invita Bee kit, it comes with five natural reeds, which are visually attractive to the bees, and mm -hmm. um, we add those in the kit so that you can help bring the bees to nest inside of your reusable wood nesting tray, which is in this picture. Um, and you, so you just put the reeds on top and then spray the entire set of trays and reeds a few times. And those, they will prefer the reeds first, but once those are full, they'll move into the rest of your wood nesting tray. And that's why we have the reeds in the kit. Yes, and actually for the brand new people, we always suggest trying out reeds first because uh, Mason people use every read first. They're just, we think it's the visual. I can find mine uh, like that. Yeah, so what, that reads are their favorite nesting holes. So a lot of these uh, other questions are going to get um, answered in this slide. So I'll turn my mic off. Thanks. Okay, so where to put the house? Um, the, we typically say head height. If I'm a six foot eight person, I put a six foot eight. If I'm a four foot five person, I put at four foot five, uh, just so you can see what's going on. It's really, really entertaining. Morning, sunny wall. Um, shade doesn't really help. Try not to have it hidden behind bushes. So obviously on a wall, non-moving. So we're not uh, tying it up by a piece of string. We've, um, I've learned. Um, so I, I was out in the middle of an orchard with a couple scientists around me and there was a pile of reeds that was right here and all these bees were going in and out of these reeds. It was on a real stiff wire and I just bent the reeds 90 degrees, just like that. And all of a sudden there was this ball of bees here on the outside where the entrance used to be. 10 minutes, the bees would fly back and come here. They, they just need to know precisely where that hole is. So before we left, we moved it back and all of a sudden bees went in non-moving house is best on a pole side of a house okay um head height uh the right holes so plus or minus five sixteenths of an inch plus or minus uh eight millimeters so seven eight or nine uh, you're putting the house and the bees out there about now when dandelions are showing up temps are kind of 50 55 and um the cocoons need to be hidden uh, we don't want birds to get to them. Very easy thing to do. We don't want the wind to blow it away. So just this year, we developed our cocoon hatchery system. And it's either uh, this or, um, let me, see. oh, I can't get to it. Um, we've got a, a tube now that has a hole in the end. It's, it's low cost. Put your cocoons in there and the, and the bees will emerge when they need to. You'll see, um, you'll see the males will come out and then head right back in that hole waiting for the females so you'll see bees going in and out of there it's the males uh, the females will come out and move so uh, if you don't have this you can put a, a dixie cup on the top little part a little milk dud box something just stop the wind from blowing the things away and we've learned direct sunlight um, just bakes your bees Um, mud, 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 mud. Okay, one more time. Mud, moist mud. This, uh, if I took a cactus pulp using bee and moved it up to the northeast, the bee would not do well because there's no cactus pulp. If we take a clay using bee and put it into a sandy, loamy environment or a grassy, mulchy, asphalt, you know, environment, if there's no clay, the bee will fly away. They need moist clay. 
And we're not talking about wet dirt. We're actually looking for sticky mud, okay? And so if you don't have that, and, and honestly, it's, it's low cost. We have mason bee mud, okay? And even if you are, um, what we're doing is you're putting a hole in the ground. You're just, you're, if you've got a clay E yard, expose the ground because your mason bees are going to go down mouse holes. They're going to grab the, the moist dirt. They're going to mine it from the side wall of a hole. Okay. Anything on the surface, if it's just a surface mud, in the morning it's super wet, in the evening it's super dry, and the bees will fly away more, more than likely. So side of a hole, you're putting this mud there, and if you're if you're and you're letting the groundwater keep that mud moist. If you've got a real free flowing um, drainy soil, we've got a thing called a mud box, super low cost. It's just, it's a means of uh, keeping your mud moist in an arid environment. So mud, 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 mud. Um, I'm sure I got a question mark. Any, any questions? So we're talking about house and importance of mud and the distance of mud, your mud, you're putting this mud box maybe 15, 10 feet away um, towards the ground. And and no bowl, no open bowls or anything. You're you're really putting the mud in the ground. Yeah, we we had a lot of questions about mud, and I I would like to explain. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the location of where you put the mud near the bee house, and you don't want to put it directly under the bee house because if you think about it, the bee would have to fly like a rocket from the ground up to the bee house with this giant heavy ball of mud in its jaws. So it would be. That's why it's better to put the mud source ten feet away. Um, about 10, 10 or fifteen feet away. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to put it too far from the bee house either. Um, so a lot of people um, they try to put the mud mix into a container, and we don't recommend doing that because the mud mix will either um, it's too soupy. Too yeah, it, it will be soupy. the The bees won't be able to get in and and get the mud out or it will dry out too quickly. So it, it's best if you can put the mud into a wedge in the ground so that the bees can gather the mud um, from the side of the hole that you've made in the ground. And the groundwater will help keep the mud um, moist throughout the day. And they'll be able to find um, the consistency that they're looking for. If you have really sandy soil in your yard, then we've got the Mason Bee Mud Box, which is on this picture. Um, and that solves the problem of putting the mud mix into a container. Right. So that probably answers our question. Um, hopefully. So the, the mud box use, keeps the mud wet with a capillary action, which you can't do with a container. If using. Um, Tap litter would work. Yeah, I think tap litter is fine. It's just. Oh, no, no, no. They were asking about using cat litter as a source of clay. Oh, cat litter. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, all the cat litter that I could find um, around me was always shale. If you can find um, based on clay, I think that would work. And there's nothing magical about our mud mix, I promise you. It's just, this is a great, this is exactly the mud they want. So whether you get it from us, or go find it in a local area and bring it in. Nothing magical about our mud. Okay, and so you can, you might not need to buy clay from us either. You, the first thing you could do is go check your soil, get a trowel or a shovel and open up a wedge and pour some water in there and play with it and see, does it stick together like clay? Or is it really, really gritty? Or does it have too much organic material in it? Okay, so, so you, you can tell play with it, right? Yeah, we've thought about this a lot. Yep. yep. <laughs> yeah, it's a really, big deal. It's a big deal. They, they, won't, they can't build their they can't build their nest if they can't find clay nearby. Yes. So I think that's all of the questions about mud. So one thing I didn't I know it's not on the slides. Um in a yard, just heads up, lawn treatment used to be called um chem lawn nowadays, they call it true green. Even from your neighbor's yard, the downwind plume of this. Uh, a honeybee has to support its hive and it flies through toxic stew to get to and support the queen. A mason bee, I think they just give you the wing and they just fly off. And so we've learned through hard, you know, hard field trials, ooh, uh, 
chemical smells aren't necessarily good for your bees. I think after they nest, they can probably stand a little bit, but boy, if you can avoid spraying chemicals or, and talking with your neighbors while your bees are starting out, less chemical smelling environments are better for your bees. Just saying. I didn't say don't do it. And if you absolutely need to spray, think about it, doing it in the evening, um, dusk when the bees aren't flying. Okay, so summertime. Um, the eggs have um, been laid. They've turned in. Here's a picture of what the, one of the larvae looks like. Um, we want you pulling these things out. Parasitic wasps can get through the side walls of holes. Um, so we're, we're asking you to just take your nesting material out, put them into, this is a bee guard bag of ours, um, just, just protects it, keeps the mice from getting into it. Oh my gosh, crows love to pull on reeds and just pull them on, just drop them on the ground. Why? It just has got to be exciting. I don't know. Take them out. Uh, you're putting the mud end up. Okay, so mud end always up. And you're just putting this into your shed or garage. There you go. Not a lot of work. Okay, we're just asking you to protect your bees. Okay, big deal. Why harvest cocoons? There's nature is not pretty. It's eat or get eaten. It just is. Okay, so there's inside these holes uh, chalk brood. It's a fungal infection, turns your mason bees into fungally shaped. This used to be a larva and it turned into this. Okay, they're, they're just there. It's just naturally. There's pollen mites. Uh, they came in with your mason bee and a pollen mite's job is to eat pollen. And then as that pollen was gathered, the pollen mite came with it. And it's no big deal. This pollen mite's in here and you can't do anything about it. Okay. Houdini flies. It's a, I mean, my next slide is going to be all about this. Uh, Houdini flies is an, another nasty little thing. And then um, uh, parasitic wasps, mono, is you'll find if you only use little thin holes, you're going to find, um, uh, I'm sorry, thin like nesting materials, you're going to find uh, these little telltale signs that a parasitic wasp, this is a big version of it, uh, poked her ovipositor right through, laid her eggs into the larva. It was kind of like aliens after a long time. The, the parasitic wasp uh, larva ate our bee from the inside out and Blah, and they, they emerge from these holes. Too thin of holes, okay. But you can do something by harvesting. And when you're harvesting, you are um, separating the good guys from the bad guys. You're gonna wind up with cocoons in your hands. It allows you to know how many bees you've got because they all didn't survive, I promise. And you'll then know what to do for the following season. Um, I do want to show this next picture. So this is this is up and coming. This is the Houdini fly, and uh, we saw this in uh, the Northwest a couple of years ago in our stuff. We found these funny little what we didn't know what it was, but there was something was there. And then a year later, we found this in you know maybe we have I don't know three hundred thousand bees being raised, and we found this in a lot of maybe hundred a couple hundred of these places. And what's this? And so this last season here uh, last October. We found this in the Northwest in 2% of all of our bees. So we probably lost a good 5,000 bees to what's this? Okay, it's a big deal. We, we reached out to the USDA. We reached out to the Washington, Oregon and, and British Columbia to help us understand what this thing was. We've talked with Cornell. It is indeed a German um, Houdini fly. And in Europe, it's their number one pest. Looks just like a fly. Okay, it's a it's a big deal. It matches the mason bees. It overwinters right inside our little holes. It comes out with our mason bees. And the maddening part about it, these every one of these things is a fly. They're going to go out and they just spread and spread. We are expecting the Northwest to lose about 10% of our bees this year. Okay, it's a big deal. And so we're asking um, one, you know, if you see a fly loitering around. Just smush it. We're told from our uh, Swiss colleagues, it, uh, it it doesn't move. It just you can squish it with your finger. If it moves on you, grab a bottle of water and just spray it, and it'll drop. It'll you know you can get to it. Smush those that you can, and please, um, in the winter uh, when you're harvesting, 
get rid of all of the things that look like this. We know that it's in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and we know that do-gooders spreading their mason bees from here to their friends in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey now have the Houdini file there too. So just please, you know, one, don't pass cook if don't pass mason bees only in the hole. Pass cocoons. There's my want. Okay. Uh okay. Pests, why to harvest? Any questions? Um, we do have a lot of questions about the Houdini fly. Um, let's see. Do you think that there is a plant or some kind of material that could um, discourage the Houdini fly? Um, no, according to our friends in Europe, no. And that, that's because they're, they're really after the, the pollen and nectar loaf that the mason bees have gathered inside yep. of the bee house. They're, they're attracted to the bee house. So the best way to protect against the Houdini fly is to harvest your cocoons. So use nesting materials that are easy to open. And the other thing you can do is while you're having fun watching the mason bees build their nest, you can... Um, squish the Houdini flies and, and they have they have red eyes they look a lot like a fruit fly and we're told oh, that they're very slow yeah yeah they're they're pretty small like a fruit so fly we're gonna see if we can create a solution it's uh, it's not easy with uh, COVID-19 going on right now uh working the USDA is closed down we're trying to see if we can come up with something that'll stop this but we're probably now held out a year so big deal to us, uh, we, we care. And my mason bee industry, my peers were scared. It's, it's a, a scary little thing. And it's caused by nice people out there not knowing what they're doing with bamboo products-ish. You know, I'm saying that in loving words, it's just, it just is. We, so we do recommend that if you have a, uh, a bee house that uses bamboo or mm. dope Go ahead, finish the verse. Your bamboo bee house, put the entire thing inside of our bee guard bag. It's it's really big. It can fit a whole, um, most of the uh, bamboo bee houses out there. And you can control the release of your bees when they're emerging. So as the adult mason bees come out, you can let them out of the guard bag. Open but, it up. Um, yeah and let, let them fly out but um it you should be able to um keep the pest population down by they'll, they'll be trapped inside of that bee guard bag but you can squish the houdini fly and whatever else is not a mason bee um good good cover yeah thanks Maris. yeah okay um uh, and the wintertime simple you can leave your cocoons outside. Uh, what happens, uh, the stored fats in the bees, the warmer it is, the faster those stored fats are, are consumed by the bee. By keeping them in your fridge, the metabolism is low and the bees consume it slower. And so if you want to put your bees out for later April, you're able to do so because you've kept them in the fridge. Um, nature has them outside we get that we're trying to help you um, place bees out there for pollination so you're storing them this is um, our humidity bee, what you're looking at a picture here of and if you store them in your fridge which is fine uh, modern frost refrigerators just dehydrate things and so this is a humidifier we're just putting a little tablespoon in the water and and you might get mold that shows up there we'll tell you what to do in bee mail and on our website Anything um, or should we jump? Well, so we do have a lot of questions about releasing the mason bee cocoons. <laughs> and I'm realizing now that for next week, we'll add a good slide to explain, answer a lot of these common questions about releasing the mason bee cocoons. Um, a lot of it has to, a lot of the questions have to do with timing. Like how long does it take for the bees? Like I'm, they're worried about the bees emerging. Um, do you want to cover that? Yeah, let's do it real quickly. Um, so realizing that the bees are naturally going to come out on their own, they take their time, 
And it's a lot of it in this equation of when does the B come out? Uh, I believe it's a function of how much stored fats are still in our bodies and temperature and maybe a couple other th humidity levels, but there's a couple things that go into that equation, but predominantly it's um, stored fats. Cause I can take a Mason B cocoon in the fall and have it sit on my desk for a month and nothing happens. Okay. So in springtime, if there's a lot of stored fats, that eh, doesn't necessarily come out that well. Um, you can, um, if push comes to shove, if you need this bee emerging, you've got a cherry tree at the very beginning, you can open a cocoon up with a pair of scissors and release the bee to go do their thing. Um, but it might take a bit of time. So you're taking your cocoons, you're putting them into something that the wind's not gonna blow around, not too deep. You don't wanna have inches of cocoons because the bees have a tough time getting out those that emerged. So um, a release chamber like our uh, cocoon hatcheries, you can find those under our accessories in our on our website. Um, you're gonna put them out when you want them to come out and realize it's gonna take a day or so. You're gonna find on the, we don't, Demaris will add meconium. Um, you're gonna find a uh, little tan mason bee poop um, on the outsides of where these cocoons are because that that's it's a met metabolic waste that um, meconium that all creatures have with it as they've been hibernating so you'll see that the boys are going to come in and out looking for the females and the females will just take their time so the bees have all come out now here's a scary part did they nest in the holes that you provided most of the time yes they do they're looking for pollen good clay and holes of the right size. If you're missing pollen, they're gonna fly someplace else. If you're missing moist clay, they're gonna fly someplace else. If your yard smells like chemicals or your neighbor's yard smells like chemicals, they could go someplace else. And so most, I'm gonna say 90% of our customers um, have clay, have listened to us and the bees, one or two bees will nest. Success, one or two bees will nest and um, uh, sometimes it's a waiting game, and if you want to, uh, in the evenings, wait a couple of days, four or five days, shine a flashlight down there, and you can see noses or tails in the holes. Um, it is, you know, and then you'll just see them doing their thing. And even even later, all, you know, I can see one bee, I feel so dejected, and then all of a sudden you walk on by and there's just a mud-filled hole. Well, like, how did that happen? Well, probably as you were sitting there waiting for a bee to come by, uh, she's out during her 30 minutes gathering pollen and you just missed it. So patience, it's not, it's not an easy word, but patience um, for them to do their thing is is a huge word, but it's uh, it's a word we use a lot when we're trying to problem solve with people. Um, that your yeah, so there there's a common question that we've been getting um, on Facebook and um, messages and stuff. If you have 50 degree weather, but then the weather cools down, should people put the bees back in the fridge? And I don't think that's a good idea. Once I you set them outside, just leave them outside. Don't worry mm -hmm. about nighttime freezing temperatures because um, bees are able, they're able to survive uh, freezing temperatures outside. So once you've set them outside, uh, don't worry about the weather dipping back down. The bees will just stay asleep or um, We'll kind of wait out the cold weather. Any other? We have you guys. I know it's it's been now almost exactly an hour. Yeah. We have one yeah, or two we, more we've minutes. We've got a lot of questions, but okay. um, well, hopefully gonna... our presentation has answered them. So yes. Okay, so we can. So just real quick, like we have a program B buyback that we have gardeners across the nation working with us. The the bees of um, Pennsylvania are mailed back to us, we're given, we're exchanging, we're giving certificates for things. So we get bees of Pennsylvania that we protect and we manage and they're stored here. And then those same bees go back to Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And so we have bees from across the country that um, you guys are raising and they go into yards and into farmland. So um, it's a cool program and we need your help. So we 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 want you successful. Um, we have a bee called a leaf cutter bee. 
It's a whole different bee. We'll do a, we'll do a webinar in May. I think this will be successful. Um, smaller. They don't use mud. They use leaf bits, and it's you know look at all these colors of different leaves that was came from this one person's yard. So cool little bee. So we have leaf cutters that are there, and then this is a big piece for us. Um, we know that out of the bees of the world, roughly 25% nest in holes, 20, 25%. Out of North America, only two of these uh, thousand species of bees are used for pollination. Uh, where are all the other ones? And so we have this program that we're trying to find just the different types of bees that nest in holes. And we have, um, I don't know, thousands, thousands of people helping us across the country putting out reeds and we teach people what to do but uh, it's a four-phase program of ours let's go find the bees of new mexico you know let's learn how to raise those bees working with um, university of new mexico let's go increase those populations then ultimately um once this is years from now once we've learned about them raised a lot of them we then be putting them back up where they're missing whether in wild space into farmlands that we've worked with or into into your yard um, it's a big program. We're the only ones really talking strategically about this. And before these bees are gone, um, we think it's important to find them. And so part of it is, hey, join us. Um, and then most of you probably went to our website and saw, you know, this advertisement, you know, for the to register. We have a thing called Bee Mail. Damaris is the key writer. Carl, who you hear the other voice out there is, man, he is so awesome with videos and pictures and stuff. So it's a, it's a production. We really, really care. And it's there for you. You know, our website, super, super easy to read. It's well laid out. But the email is just timely little tips. And we're just, we, we do it for you. So um, on the bottom of any of our pages on our website, you'll just see a little little box down there that says email. Just toss your email in there and it, it stays with us. We don't we don't sell it. We don't believe in that. So um, that's it. We've got a website that really, it's a big website. We have a lot, a lot of information, uh, intuitive. We've got videos. Damaris is our Facebook queen. She's awesome. We're on Instagram. Um, if you're local, come join us uh, at a harvest party. All, you know, we have a lot of people rotate through our building. Um, Oregon uh, Portland Nursery is doing this now, and we can, you know, we're starting to see people doing this in the fall. Um, I think that's it. Um, go ahead. Any other questions, Damaris, that are dying or dying to be asked? Um, we did have, um, I saw a theme about people asking about if you're raising mason bees and leafcutter bees, or if you can use the same bee house to also raise leafcutter bees. Uh, the, house the house keeps the keeps holes the dry. And so uh, we would always have you put the right size holes in for the bees that you're trying, if you are productively trying to raise bees. So we have house stays the same. You're taking your spring mason bee equipment out, storing that, and you're putting now your summer leaf cutters um, nesting holes in the house. So same house, different holes for the different bee. If you are building, they come have small, medium, and large, so four mil, six mil, eight mil holes out all season long. Oh, there. Um, another theme is how to protect the bees against birds. Do you want to explain our um, bird guard? Yeah. God, okay, let me, um, <laughs> okay, since we're still on my whole same, can I, okay. Um, so you Yeah, I'm realizing we've got... We, we can improve our next webinar by adding a couple yes. of key so things. Here's our cocoon hatchery and here's, you know, here's what it looks like. There's a really, um, there was a video here that Carl put together. So, um, there's, go look at this. It's a good video. Um, I haven't seen shop, that video yet. I know it's down there. I asked him. Okay. So here's accessories. <laughs> um, hatcheries. And what are we looking for, Demers? The bird guard. Oh, bird guard. There it is. Um, yep. Just a simple, um, on the front of any house, we've, we've learned that a half inch and smaller holes are almost too tight and they kind of mess up bee wings. Uh, this is three quarters of an inch off the right. One inch, you can still get birds through there. So three quarter inch, uh, we've got bird guards for our houses, you know, whether it's a, um, um, 
or B station or, or whatever. But so that we think is a good idea if you've got birds. The, the bees in the morning are just yummy little treats. They just are. So um, if you have a bird feeder, I would have the mason bee house um, out of sight if you could help it. Just, you know, around the corner or something. Other questions, Tobias? Um, well, um, people are still asking about how long does it take before you start to worry about your mason bee cocoons, if they're viable. Um, I would like to suggest uh, that people can candle their mason bee cocoons mm. um, as, as a way to help them figure out what's if there is, uh, because mono, what happens with mono is the, the mono wasp lays their egg inside of a mason bee larva and the larva live long enough to spin their cocoon. And then the mono are inside of, um, inside of the mason bee cocoon. And so you might think that you have a healthy cocoon and we do, we do screen for mono, um, before we mail out our cocoons. There you go. So that, that is a picture that I took of mono larva inside of a mason bee cocoon. Um, and when you, when you candle the cocoon, you can see these little masses of larva inside of the, the cocoons. Um, so that, and, that's and one way to check. The other way is take a picture. Um, you can, we've got a little video that shows how to snip around the edges of a cocoon um, to see what's in there. And by May, if the bees happen to come out, either it's full of mono, ready to come out, um, the bee is dead, or it just ran out of a little bit of energy somehow. And by by snipping the cocoons in early May, you can release bees that just ran out of energy. Having a little, um, we put these bees on dandelions, they just, man, tongues out, grab the nectar and off they fly, or even a sponge with uh, sugar water would resuscitate off they fly. So you can rescue if you want to. And yeah, our, our bees are, um, they're fairly healthy. Uh, we so recommend that you set out them out by May 1st mm -hmm. and around, around May 1st is when you can really start to worry about their viability. Yes. Okay, guys, we, we're coming up to the end of our time, so we're going to need to wrap it up. I think we're done. All right. Well, uh, we have everyone's questions on file. We're going to try to answer those offline. Thank you, everyone, for for all of your questions. Um, we are also going to have uh, another webinar uh, same time uh, next week. So check your check your emails and check our, our Facebook if you want to join us for that as well. Um, we'll pass this off to a friend, let them know. Exactly, yeah, yeah, spread, spread the word. Thank you all for joining. Yep. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.